second you do it. Yes, got it. Yeah. So welcome everyone to this new session of the BioClock Academy. Uh, very nice that you are all joining, uh, especially because this time uh, it is not the usual BioClock Academy clock time, uh, but I can promise you that it will be worth it because the topic also fits to the blooming season we are all in right now. Uh, this lunch session is a late night session for our guests today who join us from New who joins us from New Zealand, uh, but uh, no more spoilers right now because she will be uh, introduced soon. Uh, my name is uh, Wana Georgiana Rus Oswald. I am a postdoc in the BioClock Consortium and together with Hannah Brooks, uh, a PhD student in the same consortium, we will host this session. Um, the BioClock Consortium is a Dutch research organization which was set up to study different aspects of the biological clock. Uh, and its research focuses uh, on three aspects, the BioClock in humans, in health and in society. And the BioClock Academy is a lecture series organized within this consortium and it is addressed to anyone who is interested in the field of chronobiology, uh, but especially it is addressed to early career researchers. So the aim is to introduce you to the basic concepts and equip you with the proper theoretical knowledge by experts in the field. And uh, this lecture series is every month. So on the third Wednesday of every month, we will meet in this Zoom environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and for the time frame uh, for today, we will have a 40 minutes talk uh, followed by 15 minutes of discussion. So roughly one hour uh, so that we can close the session at one. And during the talk, you can also write your questions in the chat so that we can discuss them at the end of the talk. But I think it's also nice if you can just uh, raise your hand and we can have a proper discussion. Um, yeah, so now I give the floor to Hannah who will introduce our speaker, which I already spoiled a bit. <laughs> yes, you did. Uh, no, so also hello from me. Um, I indeed will introduce you to uh, Dr. Alan Sirat, who is joining from uh, the dark night uh, of New Zealand. Uh, so uh, Alan works in New Zealand uh, as a research professor at the in um, Nelson Melbro Institute uh, for Technology. And prior to this position, um, she worked as an assistant professor and director of education uh, at the uh, Institute for Environmental Sciences at the University of Leiden. So experiencing both these uh, kind of extremes in the light pollution gradient, um, this kind of sparked her research also. So she's been working on the effect of artificial light at night on plant communities, and the mechanisms by which uh, this affects uh, species interactions also. Um, but next to her work on light pollution, she's also been involved in a variety of studies on plants, uh, mainly focusing on um, their reaction to the environment. So uh, both looking into very small scale uh, plant uh, trades, but also at the bigger scale to uh, vegetation uh, shifts and uh, climatic responses. Uh, so based on this, I think we have a very good speaker uh, for the topic of today, so the biological clocks of plants. And I guess most of us are actually working on other organisms, so I think this will be an illuminating talk. Uh, so yeah, go ahead, uh, Ellen. Thank you. Share my screen. All right, is that all set? Great, thank you. Uh, so yeah, thanks Georgiana and Hannah for the introduction and thanks to the BioClock Academy for the invitation. It's a great initiative and uh, very nice to be here today. So the daily rotation of the Earth on its axis is, has resulted in a, a oscillation of light instant intensity between day and night. And together with the lunar cycles and the seasonal cycles, this is probably one of the most reliable features of life on Earth over the past three and a half billion years or so. And it's been an extreme, but also very predictable daily rhythm. And that rhythm of light and dark has set a bit of a temporal blueprint for a wide range of biological processes. And the key one for that is um, circadian rhythm of organisms. And the natural, um, the natural 
I'll see if I can stop this now. I can't. Yeah, here we go. Um, otherwise, it gets light again. We don't want that quite <laughs> quite yet. <laughs> um, so one of the key uh, things about circadian rhythms is, is that it allows organisms to coordinate their biology with this daily rhythm of day and night. And perhaps even more importantly, um, it allows um, them to anticipate changes that are going to happen. So clocks enable you not only to sort of adjust things as they happen, but also to um, adjust the biology and the physiology and behavior of an organism to be appropriate for what's happening next. And this um, video that I'll be showing shortly is one of the best movies that I know of that shows the anticipation of the, of the biological clock. So this is one day in the life of a sunflower in the state somewhere. And on your right hand side is the east where the sun comes up on the left is the west. And over time, you can see that the shadows are getting longer. And, and at night, at some point, the, the, you'll, the, there'll be a little light to keep the video go, going. Um, you can see that this, the plant is solely tracking the leaves and then the leaves are, remain oriented to the sun, but now, at night, all of a sudden reconfigures itself and then it is anticipating, it knows where the sun is going to come up. It's about ready and here is the light. And I think this is such an amazing um, uh, way of, of showing what the biological clock is doing. This plant is anticipating what's about to happen to it and it's getting ready to make the most of the sun as it's coming up. Um, straight from the moment that, that there is light, it will be able to, um, uh, yeah, to make use of that. So for the first two millennia of study, the science of circadian rhythms or chronobiology, as it's also called, was really the science of, of planned circadian rhythms. It was already in the fourth century um, before Christ, during the marches of Alexander the Great a long time ago in the Persian Gulf, that um, it was observed that the Tamarin tree um, that had daily leaf movement. Um, after that, there's nothing really for a very long time in the literature about anything to do with rhythms of plants until uh, 1729. When uh, there's a French astronomer here uh, uh, pictured, uh, Jean-Jacques de Marin, he experimented with a cute little plant called Mimosa pudica, a sens sensitive plant, it's also called. And it, it, it's, you may know it, it's one of those plants that when you touch the leaves, it, it sort of folds it up. But it also opens its leaves when the sun rises and, and folds them back closed when, when it gets dark. And so he wanted to test whether this was in response to the daylight. So he locked them in a dark cupboard and found that, yes, the leaves actually still opened, even though, and they closed again, exactly following the daylight outside, even though those plants weren't exposed to any of those lights at all. Um, so at the time in, in 1729, he proposed that the circadian timekeeping was an innate property of the plant. Um, that wasn't really accepted at the time um, because rightly so, um, people proposed that it could be other external um, oscillations like temperature or electromagnetic some things that, that had not been ruled out properly. So it took um, a little bit longer for that to happen. And more than a century actually uh, passed before it was realized that those rhythms were not exactly 24 hours, um, but approximately the cir circadian or approximately one day. Um, and was, for this, this particular species, it's about 22 to 23 hours. Um, and um, Kandal found this out, and he also found out that the leaf movement um, can be entrained to different photocycles if you invert the rhythm, and, uh, and then in response to reversal in the alternation of light and dark, then, then the, um, the movement changes. And it was also noted that um, that there's uh, a temperature compensation, and so that that the, this this rhythm remains the same regardless of the temperature. So each of the defining attributes of what we now call circadian rhythm, including the endogenous origin, it's innate to the plant, and that it persists in constant conditions. It can be entrained, and it's temperature compensated. That's really 
first appreciated in the leaf movement in the rhythms of plants. It turns out that it's not just leaf movement, but in fact, actually just about any phenomenon of plant in study that is in some way related to the time of day. Now, it was much later, um, not until almost 1900 in 1898, that rhythms and pigmentations were observed in crabs and mammals and rodents were um, even later. Now, of course, uh, you all in the in the BioClock consortium are looking at coronabiology across a whole range of organisms, um, including mammals and humans. Um, and some of these topics have already been touched upon by others that have been presenting in this BioClock Academy. But today I will stick with the topic of plants and their biological clock. And as a plant ecologist, over time I've worked on a variety of impacts. Um, on the effects of human activities on plant ecophysiology, um, ecology, and biodiversity. And I, I became interested in this topic of plant biological clock really through thinking about the impacts of artificial light at night on plants. And knowing that light is so critical, not only for the biological clock of all organisms, including plants, but also because plants harness the sun's powers through photosynthesis. So it's got this other additional factor um, that makes light important. And so I started studying how light at night can disrupt plant processes and interactions between plants and other organisms. So the rest of my talk, I'll describe some basic knowledge on the circadian rhythms of plants, um, both in daily and seasonal patterns, the role of light therein, and how artificial light at night is affecting some of these rhythms and processes. So in plants, whatever process you're looking at, there's a pretty good chance that there's an influence of time of day. Um, whether you're talking about metabolism, growth, hormone signaling, flowering, or how plants deal with stress and uh, from biotic resources, including herbivory, or how, how they deal with cold snaps and drought. And the circadian clock really occupies the central position in the regular network of plants. So traditionally, it was thought of a really linear pathway in which there was an environmental stimulus like light and temperature, and they entrain the clock, and then that regulates a bunch of output pathways. However, it's a lot more complicated than this. Um, so let's look at it in, in a little bit more detail. So this figure, which will become more complicated as it goes as the slide goes on, uh, summarizes some of the inputs and the core oscillators of the plant. Um, clock and the output rhythms, and they also respond back to each other, and together they constitute the whole circadian system of the plants. So at the top, you can see the environmental signals such as sunlight, temperature, and humidity, and nutrition are, are common side gabers or time cues that um, uh, are the inputs, and they reset and synchronize the circadian clock, and then. The second row here is really the core oscillators, all the genes that are expressed sequentially from dawn here until night. And they're expressed sequentially, forming a bit of an interlocked feedback loop. Um, essentially, they're really complicated, interrelated on off switches in a whole series of transcriptional activators. And doing this, you can build up a stable 24 hour oscillation with the whole series of these feedback loops. Um, now, the output pathway, what, what is being regulated is at all sorts of levels, it's at molecular and biochemical level, um, where it's about gene transcription, protein activity, and, and the metabolism, um, and hormone uh, cycles. And at, at a more physiological level, it's about the rhythmic output, um, or how stomata open and close um, and that governs how photosynthesis is, is um, regulated. Um, the photoperiodic flowering, photosynthesis itself, leaf senescence um, and um, herbivory interactions and so on. All of these processes are rhythm rhythmic and driven by the biological clock. Now a lot of these output pathways also feedback in our internal cues that also affect how this whole um, system works. Um, so, so it's very um, 
it, it's a very complicated system with a lot of feedback loops and also a lot of redundancies built in. Now, where is this thing called circadian clock in plants? Um, there's actually evidence that there's multiple and different circadian clocks present in different tissues of the plant. And they first figured this out in beans when they had been growing in light and dark and they put them in free running conditions in dark conditions all the time. And then they found that stomata opened um, at a certain rhythm. Photosynthesis was happening at a certain, certain rhythm and it kept going and leaf, lip, the leaflets were moving, but all of these were moving at different rates and they displayed different periods. That's in. So, um, for example, the, the endogenous period of the shoot is much shorter than the root. Um, so this is quite different to, to mammals, for example. They have a central clock that's located in the suprachiasmatic nucleus of the hypothalamus in the brain, and there's a peripheral clock, and they sort of operate so autonom autonomously. But in plants, there's these circadian rhythms that are in individual organs and parts of the same tissue even uh, differ significantly. Um, so for example, if, if you have two opposite leaves from the same seedling and you independently entrain them in light dark cycles or dark light cycles, then those two leaves display um, circadian rhythms with an antiphase. So they do exactly the opposite. Until recently, it was very recently, it was largely unknown how these different clocks actually um, synchronize with each other. So the circadian rhythm in the uh, shoot apex, in the shoot here, is, is similar to that of the whole seedling. Um, and um, the ability of the shoot apex to synchronize with the external cues, uh, that works much better. So it responds more, much more to light, for example. And then it has these, it, because photosynthesis is happening in this same um, organ, the sucrose that pr that's produced um, gets transported around the, uh, around the seedling, um, and that uh, that affects how the circadian rhythm is expressed in the roots. And so, it sort of suggests that, that from the, sh the the shoot root sort of system, there's a master slave relationship. So, it's sort of in charge, but not fully. Um, so, there's, um, for example, flower the timing of flowering and how stems or hypocotyledons um, and how they grow, um, that indicates that, that they are not actually related to the shoot apex at all. So if, if, if you cut it off, that still keeps going. So the shoot doesn't really fully control the surroundings like um, the SCN master clock of mammals does, for example. So sugar level levels, and this, this is really as, as new as 2018 or so, um, that, that it's known that sugar levels actually synchronize the different clocks within uh, an individual plant. So for plants, light is a resource. The, um, the chloroplast allows for photosynthesis, it absorbs light energy, and it fixes that inorganic CO2, um, and produces glucose and oxygen. But light is also the main input to the clock and the effects on the circadian timing of, in the system depend on the intensity um, on the spectrum, on the duration and the pattern of the stimulus of the light. So, how do plant, plants actually sense light? There's, there's different things going on. So there's the photosynthetic component of it. Um, so that's the chloroplast that runs that and the, and, um, the spe action spectrum for photosynthesis is defined by the absorption spectrum of chlorophyll and the carotenoids. And so um, here, there's the photosynthetic active radiation, so light of wavelength 400 to 700, which largely overlaps with our human eye, our human vision. That's photosynthetically active radiation. Um, and that defines, that, that determines 
uh, the photosynthetic um, capacity and, and um, activity of plants. But plants also use light as information and entrainment for the circadian clock. And, and there's a variety of situations observed regarding the different wavelengths that entrain the clock. So on the bluer end of the spectrum and almost moving into the UV, there's the cryptochromes, and they're involved in regulation of seed germination um, and plant development and DNA repair. There's phototropins um, that uh, often together with the cryptochromes are involved in regulating um, some of the circadian clock response shade avoidance. Um, and, uh, oh pardon, the, the, the phototropins are, are uh, about movement of the plants relative to light source. I got my, I got ahead of myself because I was starting to talk about the phytochromes already. Together with the cryptochromes, they really are involved in regulating the circadian clock. And they appear to be involved in the timing of phenological events of, of um, a lot of things, including germination, flowering, and bud bursts as well. So it's a crypto, it's the, the cryptochromes is seed germination, phototropins is really plants growing towards the light, but the phytochromes are really the key player, and that's what I'll be focusing on for most of the rest of the talk. So zooming in on the action of these phytochromes, it's, they're a protein pigment that absorbs red and far red light most strongly, but it does absorb a little bit of, of blue light as well, as well, for example, you can, you can see that here in the absorption spectra for the for the two different states. So there's a PR state and a, uh, a phytochrome red and a PFR, a phytochrome far red state. And those states are photo reversible. So it sort of acts as a biological switch um, where the switches can be turned on and off by irradiating with red and far red light. So PR and is when it's illuminated with red lights turns into uh, PFR and then illuminating that with far red turns it back, it reverse, reverses it back to PR form. And that's sort of the inactive form. Also, where's my mask gone? I can no longer go forward, here we go. So the, the balance between this, these PR and PFR states really regulate cellular expression uh, processes and gene expression, including all these processes that, the processes that are going on. So there's also a much slower process that the, the, the PR to PFR under light is just about instantaneous, but there's a slow process that happens at night when um, PFR slowly reverts back to PR in the dark and it break or it breaks down over time. Um, and this is really important. All the, yeah, a lot of the things that I'll be talking about is about how the relationship of this phytochrome in the PR state and the PFR state. So one of these mechanisms that is at least partially gated by phytochromes and it's all the interactions with it is plant growth. And most plants grow faster in the evening and at night than they do during the day. And Darwin already observed that. Um, so in this movie, the pumpkins are growing and the growth spurts you can see, and they, they mostly happening at night, sort of almost appears like somebody's blowing up a balloon or something at night. So during the day, you should see the shadows and during the night, you sort of see those um, pumpkins growing. So in the daylight, those phytochromes exist mostly in this PFR form, which results in the suppression of genes that are involved in, in elongation and growth. And during the night, this PFR undergoes dark recovery, recovery slowly reverts back into this inactive PR form ready for the next day. And that increases the expression of the um so in at, at during the night when when this all happens that increases the expression of the genes that are involved in elongation and growth so 
that's really on a daily cycle, but but there's also the plants don't only need to keep track of the time of day, but also of the seasons. And it's really important um, to know what seasons are happening because you need to get your seeds germinating, flower your flowers ready to go, and the onset of bud burst and um, getting your leaves out at the right time is critical in the life cycle of most plants. And the environmental stimulus that that governs most of this um, uh, and that to identify the time of year is the photo period. So that's the relative lengths of the night and the day. And a physiological response to the photo period, such as flowering, is called uh, photoperiodism. So um, the transition from vegetative growth to flowering is precise uh, seasonal timing to, to make sure that to coordinate the flowering and um, with the right environmental conditions. So after enough growth and, and resource accumulation is happening and that the seed is being produced and also to coordinate that together with, for example, um, the pollinators and the, and the seed dispersal uh, vectors. So that coordination really requires plants to have a sense of time of the year. And um, again, this is really measured by the PFR and the PR ratio at dawn. Um, because after a long night or a short night, that ratio will be different because the, the way that those photo reversible um, uh, processes also happen in the dark recovery period overnight. And so that's reversed. So plants then measure the PFR and the PR ratio at dawn, and that stimulates the physiological uh, processes such as flowering and winter buds and vegetative growth. Of course, it's a bit more complicated and there's redundancy built in and the phytochromes work together with, with the cryptochromes that are also sensitive in, in more, more of the UVA part and the violet and the blue parts of the spectrum. Um, so together they sort of keep, keep the, um, the plant in check and together they, they sense the, light, the length of day. But the phytochromes really play a main role in that. And that's um, what I will uh, continue talking about. So these are some of the processes that are required um, or that, that are for, for which it's important to know exactly what time of year it is. So based on the flowering pattern of plants in response to this photo period, you can categorize plants into long day plants, short day plants and day neutral plants. Short day plants um, are those plants in which flowering is started, initiated or promoted when a dark night period is sufficiently long enough for the phytochrome in the PFR form to revert to the PR form. And that's, for example, um, chrysanthemums and some soybean varieties. We'll get back to that in a minute. The long day plants are like the iris down here, um, in which the dark night period must be sufficiently short to increase the night levels of this PR uh, phytochrome state. And examples, um, so this iris, but also spinach and uh, radish and lettuce and a bunch of species like that. And then there's day neutral plants that don't really have a detectable effect of darkness on their flowering at all. Uh, but they rely on other cues. And it's, for example, tomatoes and dandelions and rice. So, um, this was first uh, discovered in 1920, and it took quite a while that actually this, the, there, were mis there were misnomers because it wasn't the, the day that actually mattered, it was the, the night. So short day plants are actually long night plants. They need a long night to flower. And long day plants are, actually need a short night to flower. Um, these, these names have sort of stuck and we can't really seem to get away from them, but they're slightly confusing sometimes. Um, so the, in, in both cases, the actual number of hours in the critical night length is, is specific to each species of, of, of plant. 
Now, if you give a, uh, you can interrupt this sort of nighttime portion uh, of the of, uh, of the photoperiod for plants, and red is the perfect color to do that with. So, if you flash your red light during the dark period, um, then um, both th then it, it just uh, so then the short day plants will remain vegetative and the long day plants will flower. If you follow that up immediately by um, a far red um, pulse of light, um, then then you effectively make make it feel like the, there is two sh really there's a short day happening. Um, so if a flash of light, red light during the night is followed immediately by a flash of far red light, the plant detects no interruption of night lighting, and that, that's that far, red, far red photo reversibility. And so you can you can you can manipulate the way that plants flower by a short exposure to different lights in the middle of the night and. Um, humans exploit this actually um, in, in horticulture um, to produce flowering out of season. And by punctuating each long night with a flash of light, for example, the, they produce chrysanthemums that are normally short day plants that, that flower in the autumn and the fall. And to delay their flowering all the way to Mother's Day, they provide these pulses of light to stop them flowering until the, the flowers are required. So plants measure these measure the uh, night length very accurately. And some um, short day plants won't flower if the night is even one minute shorter than the critical length. It's really very precise. And some plants uh, always flower on exactly the same same day of the year. So flowering is not just a seasonal thing, but also, also a daily rhythm that differs um, by species. And um, so, so people like Linnaeus have looked at this and they, they came up with the idea that you could have a timekeeping garden with a 15 minute resolution based on the timing of floral opening and closing in different plants around the garden. It doesn't, it's actually quite hard to, to make that happen in, in practice, but um, um, the idea is there, and, and plants certainly uh, also uh, yeah, keep their flowering, the opening of the flowers to time. Now, of course, um, we have been introducing artificial light at night into the environment and have thereby stolen some of the, the day and the night pattern, and we've changed that, that day and night um, reliability, really, that evolution is depended on. So we have this light as a resource and light as information. And by adding then this artificial light at night, we may be actually disrupting that whole system. Um, and so the photosynthetic system itself is sensitive to light at night and sometimes even at low levels, just under a street light or even lower, um, plants can photosynthesize. Um, but then there's also how artificial light at night then affects how the biological clock of plants is operating. And again, this uh, really depends on the intensity of the light, the spectrum, the timing of it, and the duration. And so daylight and artificial light at night really do strongly differ in both quality and quantity of light output. And what makes um, artificial light unique, and I guess hard to predict is that it's a growing phenomenon and it's not just only increasing, it's also changing, rapidly evolving to the, how the technology advances. And with that, some of those um, things to do with duration, spectrum and intensity, for example. Um, so, in this graph, you can see that daylight is much brighter than than most of the the types of lights that 
that we produce as humans. So unfiltered direct sunlight can reach levels over 100,000 lux, um, where as a street light would only provide about five to 30 lux at night, at, at least at ground level where, where um, the, the herds uh, or the grasses might experience it. <clears throat> and so actually introducing a street light, for example, into an environment then has impacts artificial light at night. So A-L-A-N, that's what that stands for. And that affects the plants, but also herbivores and, inter and pollinators and, and um, pathogens and everything that lives on and in the plant. So there's all these interactions going on that creating quite a complex food web and web of interactions and impacts of artificial light at night. Now to start with photosynthesis, um, um, throwing a straight light on, on top, in this case, a, um, a yellow poplar, um, resulted in nighttime photosynthesis, but also a reduction of the efficiency of, photos, of the photosystem and the way that the stomata operated and, and allowed photosynthesis to happen. It also changed the starch balance, and that was very much um, to do um, with, the, with the circadian rhythm. So if there's a, um, a decrease, so the artificial light at night in this study decreased starch levels during the day um, and also decreased the nocturnal starch degradation, which is really important in keeping the, keeping the clock running. And eventually, it led to carbon starvation of just so this, these plants were grown for three years. And you can see how the, the top row here was in the dark and then increasing levels of light. And the, the morphology all the way from the internal leaf structures and the, and the photosynthetic processes and the circadian clock rhythms, but including the leaf morphology and the, the health of the plants were affected by the street light. Now there's an old study and it's actually one of the ones that still has got most of the species in that we know something about from 1975. Um, they looked at a bunch of ornamental garden plants and how sensitive they were to artificial light at night and looking at different light types and what impacts they had on flowering and growth rates um, at different, at sort of luminance levels to which gardens are normally um, exposed. Um, and so they found that there's both suppression and induction of flowering or enhancing or suppressing of growth, and it all depended on species. So a lot of the, work, the, the, the things that we know to date are about horticultural, the horticultural sector and how they're using light to grow plants and increase yield. But in terms of the types of levels of, of lights in the environment that we might experience outside now due to street lights and, and domestic and industrial lights and sky glow, um, that sort of type of light is not really something that's generally studied and it's only been recently starting. Um, so there are a few studies and this is a five year um, field experiment that looked at um, mesocosms under different um, colors of light. And um, so there's a dark control, an ember light, and a white um, light emitting diode. And they looked at um, wildflowers and grasses. So the wildflowers on the left and the grasses on the right. Most of the species actually didn't exhibit changes in, in growth rates in, in biomass accumulation after five years of exposure. Um, but there was one species, at least, a, a lotus plant that showed a significant impact here in the bottom left. And other studies have, in the same system have found similar things. Um, it does show that the, result, the impacts of light are, are species specific, um, but there can be negative effects of cool white LED lighting, at least. Um, now, this. Next one is an experiment on growing river, uh, growing um, gum in Australia, the river red gum in a, a sort of a, a tree set up, a tree based mesocosm. And they looked at street lights again um, at a sort of a, a standard um, intensity that you would expect outside. 
and it promoted nocturnal photosynthesis for this um, gum tree, and it distorted and changed the way that biomass was allocated and that the leaf morphology of those saplings happened. And so it actually produced differentiated sun and shade leaves um, in the canopy based because of being under a street light at night, quite different to the, the, the control uh, treatment. And so then there's also seasonal patterns. I'm hoping this is going to run. Um, and, and that's bud burst. So bud burst, for example, here, um, that, that really is um, got different hues that started. And the one is winter chilling, uh, but it's also about sp spring warm and then photo period. And the timing of this bud burst is really determined by an interaction between temperature and photo period. And Leaf's Nessence has got a similar story for a large part driven by photo period, the day length. Now, if you have a branch and then you add a light, a street light right over it, um, you create a false perception of day length in, this, um, in these leaves. And that's actually what you can see happening. There's some examples of trees close to a street light and the leaves close, actually close to the street light are still green, whereas the, the rest is already um, becoming, uh, you know, uh, autumn color. And here, this, uh, the, the, the leaves have fo totally fallen off the tree, except right around um, the street light. And there's some more uh, new examples, I guess, with really bright billboards that are also appearing to do the same thing, have much higher intensities. But it's quite tricky. There's these all these interactions between, between temperature and things to actually disentangle what is going on. Um, so you can use remote sensing and citizen science observations to try and have, get a big uh, you know, data set to play with. And so um, uh, Lise Lord Rambonet and some other students of mine, uh, myself, have looked at this in, in Europe, and other people have looked in the UK and in the US. And what we're finding is that really bud burst for some species can be up to 10 days earlier under street, under um, high um, artificial light at night environments, and lethal up to 20 days later. So that extends the season for some species by up to a month, which can be very significant in terms of changing how the way they do things and how they interact with their environment and other species interact with them. But there are interacting interactions with other cues. Now you can do a similar thing with flowering that hasn't really been looked at at all yet. Um, in, in field settings, um, and so again, using citizen science observations, overlaying that with satellites um, or remote sensely, remotely sensed um, temperature and um, and artificial light at night. You can um, you can see sort of similar patterns. Not all species are, uh, are affected at the same time, um, and some show advancement of flowering, and others a slight delay. But the biggest change does always appear to be happening at low levels of light here at the beginning, where there's a drop an advancement in the flowering date, um, and then it stays fairly similar, even if it gets way really bright. So it's really at the lower levels that things may be changing quite quickly. And this is quite a start, startling image here of soybeans. And so remember, I mentioned that this is a short day plant. It requires long nights to start flowering. And this street light provided continuous light and the plants under them continue to produce vegetatively, where this, the rest of the field produce flowers and is senescing. The street light is, is create, keeping the soybeans around it in a vegetative state. And you can even see the shadow of the light lamp post. Um, so this is quite a pronounced sort of effect. I'll just leave this one and um, move on to interacting species because effects on individual species actually sort of have a, a flow on effect on all the, all the individuals and all the species that they interact with. Um, so if artificial light at night has an effect on, an, on, a, on an 
a focal plant species and it has direct effect and it can affect um, birth and mortality and, and for non-plants also how they move around. And then abundance and distribution and community structure can be affected and that can also then affect ecosystem processes. But that same light bulb or that same street light and the same sky glow can also affect the resources and competitors um, or the predator species that this focal species depends on and therefore it has this indirect effect and all that creates these feedback loops that may um, that that are these indirect effects of, of light at night. And so an example here is plant pollinator interaction. So where you have some pollinators during the day, some during the night, and they all visit plants. And if you then add a light, what happens? Now, um, this was um, has, is, yeah, has been looked at, and when you have a really complicated um, network of, of pollinators and plants at a dark site that looks sort of like this, where the colors are different species groups, and at the bottom, the green here are the different plants, and these are all different species of, of pollinators, and they each line is a number of visits. Um, and so once you have this look at the same system, but under a street light, you get a network like this with strongly changed visitor visit, visits from the pollinators to the plants. And so it results in a 60% drop in flower visits and also a drop in fruit set as a result of a reduced pollination. And that happened even though um, the pollination during the day was just happening as it would have, presumably. And so um, Camille Spolstra and the Bioclock Consortium has also done some work on this, looking at um, the white campion um, Selene latifolia flower that's pollinated by a specialist moth. And it doesn't only pollinate the flowers, but the females, as they pollinate it, sometimes also lay eggs on the ovules, ovaries, and then the offspring actually eat the developing seeds. So it's sort of this inter interesting um, interaction so that it's both um, both a pollinator and a herbivore, or a predator even, um, of the seed. And so um, using um, a field set up with four different light treatments, they looked at the fertilized flowers and then how many infested fruits there were under the different colors and how many of the ovules were in the end fertilized. So they showed that artificial light with different colors impacts on these plant-insect interactions differently. Um, and it had direct consequences for the plant fitness. Um, Adam, uh, yes. just a brief reminder that we're almost out of time. So if yeah. you could cool. start. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well. Thanks. Um, so I will um, just close up with some of the more complicating things uh, like these trophic interactions because when you add lights to species interactions it gets really quite complicated um, and so depending on which species are affected more you may create top-down trophic effects or bottom-up ones and um, so in, a, in some work that I was involved in at uh, light on nature sites in um, around the Netherlands, we looked at some how, how the different light colors affected plant traits and how that affected herbivory. Um, and what we found is that the, um, that there's really different impacts on different species. So we looked at oak and blueberry here and different colors. So red light is, is really one, um, to watch also because what we've just talked about with the, um, the phytochrome PR and the PFR um, changes in the photoreversibility, red light seems to be um, one of the colors that is affecting how plant traits um, and herbivory interact. So where, so for oak, for example, artificial light at night changed the relationship between insect damage and growth rate and leaf thickness. So we're um, under green and uh, red light, relative growth rate 
um, resulted in more um, insect damage and in the dark control, more growth rate resulted in reduced damage. So it totally changes the, the way that all these, these um, processes interact. And these community changes um, actually benefit some species more than others. And, and the first, just in the last couple of years, we're seeing evidence that um, it's particularly common species and invasive species that seem to be able to take advantage of the light at night um, to the detriment of some of the rare and native species. But this is really um, work in progress and it's really only sort of starting in the last, it's only started um, to become a focus on uh, in the last few years. So plants can tell the time just to wrap up and light is a main synchronizer of the plant's circadian clock. And phytochrome receptors play a key role. And it, it, it continues to startle me how little research has been done into the disrupting effects of artificial light at night on plants, um, given their role in photosynthesis and feeding the world full of organisms in one way or another. And let alone the, the role of the biological clock in this is really under understudied. Um, and based on all the research that's done, that's mostly what we know is mostly based on the daytime, particularly um, how important light is and the different spectrum of it. Um, and in and it's really due to horticulture, um, but it stands to reason that the emission of artificial light at night in the environment is having an impact on plants, and we're seeing that through um, research popping up, um, you know, just about weekly now. So it's really a field to watch, I think, and I'm really excited uh, to see um, Aveline and others in the BioClock Consortium that are working on this to gain a better understanding of how it all works and how we can mitigate the impacts of anthropogenic light emissions um, on the environment around us. Um, so I think I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ellen. I, I, I think I would hear a lot of this in the audience. Uh, uh, you you fascinated so, us so much with the talk, uh, the host, host that I was chatting with Hannah. Oh, we're out of time. We should stop. Thank yeah, you. Thank you for that reminder. <laughs> I, I didn't realize how the time was flying. Uh, it was very interesting.